cheek here. They can make it three. And to the door, he has made it three. He's done it again. Scored three home games in a row in the Europa League. What a moment for the teenager. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Anacom Chelsea Podcast. How are you doing? Right, back with another episode, episode 2 of season 2. Uh, I apologise if episodes might be a little bit more infrequent this season, purely because I now have a YouTube channel, and if you have not checked it out, you should check it out, because it's predominantly about Chelsea Football Club, and it's called Football Therapy. Anyway, today's uh, on today's episode, I am, was delighted to be joined by George Benson. Um, George is a Chelsea fan, really knowledgeable about the club, great to talk to he's a youtuber as well he's got a couple of youtube channels that you'll hear about in the episode um it was a really great episode it's fun we talk about the barca game and we look ahead of what to expect from chelsea and lampard going forwards so without further ado let's get into it Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Yannick on Chelsea podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined with a special guest. I've got George Benson on the podcast. Uh, Chelsea YouTuber, football YouTuber, travel YouTuber. George, how you doing, mate? Hot, I assume? I'm, I'm very well. We're actually recording this quite late in the day, so the sun is beaming on my face, and we've got the biggest bloody heat wave England's ever seen. But yeah. other than that, I'm great. It's horrendous. I'm dying. Currently, I'm sitting with uh, gin and tonic with loads of ice, but the ice seems to have gone. <laughs> and uh, oh, where where did that go in the post? I've uh, only got a bottle of water and yeah. some like semi half eaten chewing gum. This is gross. Doesn't well, sound any like yours. I tell you what, the listener will know that the Anacon Chelsea podcast is a very liberal, relaxed format, and often guests are encouraged to have a drink by them. Usually not Ooh. water, but we'll forgive you because, as you said, <laughs> there's a heat wave. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on, man. Really appreciate it. No, I'm um, looking forward to this chat today. There's plenty to discuss. Oh, plenty, man. Yeah, so people uh, who don't know George, he's, um, he's a YouTuber. Essentially, he's got a, he's got a big channel that he does sort of travel and stuff on. He's got a, a fresh channel um, called George Benson Football. We'll plug all this at the end where he covers ma- majority of Chelsea, a bit, a bit of some other stuff as well is that right yeah i think the when i first made the channel i didn't want it to be a chelsea channel (laughs) but obviously when you're naturally just obsessed with your club anyway Mm. you're inclined to make more content about them so i think it's probably going to be like a chelsea channel with a hint of like just general football chatter once in a while i tell you what i feel you exactly um I obviously started my YouTube journey recently called Football Therapy. I was like, yeah, generally all about football, but a little bit, you know, more passionate on the Chelsea stuff. Rapidly became a sort of Chelsea-dominated YouTube yeah. channel. But I, I think maybe when the season starts, I'll probably do like a Premier League roundup over every weekend alongside loads of Chelsea stuff. But um, yeah, Absolutely. cool. So let's get into it, man. It's... Um, I'm, I, we're not going to touch last season because I've sort of done that to death and, you know, we want to look forward, but uncertainty came with Frank Lampard but you know what there's such a good feel good factor around the club that and you know the, obviously we'll talk about the recent result against Barcelona but there's so much feel good factor with Petr Cech Jody Morris um, Edwards getting promoted you know Ashley Cole just bowling up band back together the sort of young coaches that have a good relationship with the youngsters you know we can talk about Hudson Adoy signing the contract we can talk about Ru- Ruben Mount there's a feel good factor so I, I, w- I want to get just your general thoughts on how the project's changing if you have any concerns or if you're just you know buzzing or stuff like that but We'll talk about Frank's managerial approach maybe a bit more in a bit, but how do you feel about the whole step in this direction? Are you completely confident? Are you terrified? Or are you just overwhelmingly happy? What's happening? Do do you know what it was? I think towards the end of last season, I was on the fence for the entirety of last season. Yeah, yeah. And when Sari got sacked, I was actually gutted because after the Europa League final and after we looked at the league position, we looked at everything that could have been this, could have been that, all the Mm. hypothetical situations and now over, like this is the result, this is what we got. Mm. I was absolutely gutted that he left because I just thought, well, you know what, considering we're up against two of the best teams in Europe, let alone England, we've done 
everything we possibly can. Mm. I think people undervalue what winning the Europa League actually is. If you're not even in the Champions League at the beginning of the season anyway, it's mm. the best European competition you can win. Mm. So, yeah. for me, I was sad. But then, obviously, as soon as Sarri was sacked, it was only... Well, he wasn't sacked, one... was he? There was that sort of no, amicable parting, kind of. But yeah, go I on. think he, he's probably one of the only ones who can say that he's actually left on his, his terms. own terms, yeah. which I actually really respect him for. Mm. But, obviously, as soon as that initial kind of, ah, great, we're back to square one again was over and done with, it was mm. kind of obvious who it was going to be. Mm. And even during that build-up where it was like, oh, is Frank going to do it? Is he going to sign a new deal with Derby? Obviously, Chelsea weren't very vocal about it. And Derby were tweeting things saying, oh, Chelsea have approached Frank and all this mm. stuff. Mm. And Frank Lampard is my my hero. Yeah. Like, he's my world hero since, like, I was old enough to even know anybody but my flipping father. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, to have him managing the football club that we all invest so much time and love and energy and passion into... Is an amazing feeling. Whether it is a success or not, it's still to be seen. But mm. for me personally, I'm just really enjoying this this hype, this, like you said, the positivity. We've got young players that we've wanted to see come through, signing new contracts. They're obviously going to have a big part to play under him. Mm. And I think it's it's nothing but positivity, really. Mm. I'll tell you what, I, I'm with you, man. So I, on the, just to quickly on Sarri as well, there was loads of sort of variables. I think, oh, I just think what we could have done if um, we had an actual striker last season or, you know, maybe Jorginho had the because people converted some of his through balls. There's loads of sort of what ifs. I was the same. I was a bit gutted when Sari left, but I kind of respected his decision. In regards uh, with Frank Lampard, I'm, I'm like you, man. He's my most. He's the greatest in my for my money. He's the greatest ever Chelsea player. He's yeah. he, he's well presented. He's incredibly intelligent. He's kind of like you know. Uh, he's he's sharp. He's good looking. He like would represent the club well. So for me, it's like, um, it's like dreaming up a girl that you think is perfect in your head and then you're just so t- you know what uh, there was this woman like in that hit on me years ago this french girl right she was so beautiful she was a f- i was probably like 21 and she was like 26 and if i was like, i always used to play on the sort of joke how i'm half french and i always used to like imagine oh my perfect girl would be like a couple years older french musician <laughs> lady you know i had it all in yeah. my head and i met and so, so so the gods manifested this woman and basically she gave me her number and just completely hit on me and I was just so terrified of how perfect it was. I was just reacted negatively. Ultimately, I, I ballsed it up and I pussied out. But, you know, things turned out. <laughs> things, turned, things turned out right for me. But it's almost like it was... With, with Frank, it's like I was so perfect in terms of how he could represent our club that rather than looking at the positives, when it was initially rumoured, I was just terrified. I was like, oh, God, but, you know... He needs more experience, and Chelsea are in a shit show at the moment. We need to do everything we can to ensure that we give him the best environment to to succeed. Because you only get one shot with Lampard. He's the ace up the sleeve for Chelsea. You know we've got to make sure we give everything we can to make it work. And that was my sort of like outlook on the whole thing. But as you know, the the cards fell in place and everything, it kind of just seems more and more perfect. I know it was easy to say oh, you know, it's a free hit because of the transfer ban and, you know, the club are more inclined to let him play the youth and Jody Morris. But as things are falling into place, it does seem kind of perfect. Do you, do you feel like... I mean, you know, I, I was like, I'll get Jardim in for a couple of years until Frank's ready. But it's almost like it's better this way around than having a, you know, an intermittent coach in between that might have actually... When Frank arrived, it might not have been as good as it is now. Do you know what I mean? It kind of feels really right. No, I, I totally agree. I was actually hoping for a positive crescendo for your personal story with the French girl there. <laughs> but I think there's more of a like. She, pre- that... she got pregnant soon after I dodged the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> or did you? That's, that's one. Oh, that's God. Make their own decision. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take some tablets now. So that, okay, all right, Karen. <laughs> Absolutely. No, mm. I think with Frank, it's, uh, it is kind of an element of that where I think one thing that's always very interesting with Chelsea is as a fan base is we know that we are hated by virtually everybody. Mm. And as somebody who is an avid consumer of football chat, football gossip, I like to call it football bullshit. I don't really like to address it as like football Twitter. Mm. Um, I read into all of the things of like, Oh, Frank isn't ready. And Mm. it's a stupid appointment. Like this is destined to make Chelsea the banter club. Like forget about Arsenal. It's all about Chelsea. Now Yeah, we're going to finish 14th and all this. Yeah. 
And I just, for me, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that we're not going to go anywhere near the kind of levels of failure that people are suggesting that we will. Mm. I think even my rational mind, when I think about all of the things that could go against us, I'm looking at what we've seen in preseason, which everybody is so quick to jump up and say, oh, it's only preseason. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's only preseason. But you know what? We actually look pretty good. Mm. Mm. So it's not like we're even against Kawasaki. Yes, okay, we were off the pace. It wasn't. Oh, mate, up. they were mid-season super. Fitness is so important. Like people, the, I know the J League's obviously crap in comparison to the Premier League, but they're still the champions of their league, and they've got that elite winning mentality. They're halfway through the season. They're used to playing in that those conditions. There's so many fitness variables that are so important. No matter how talented you are, you know, um, you need to be fit to to win games. So. But um, you know what? That brings us on nicely. Let's talk about. Um, well, let's, we could. We we'll talk about all the sort of games, but I do want to talk about Barcelona. I want to get your thoughts on a couple of things, there, George. I I've done a couple of YouTube videos about Frank's formation and approach. One of the great things is that I had no problem with Sarri's idealism or idealistic approach to football. I kind of liked his outlook on football and his thoughts about joy and how he wants to play this Cruyffian way, kind of. But Frank's yeah. the opposite, and I I don't see that as like a stinky, negative, pragmatic coach, because he's not. He wants to play with the ball, he wants to play direct, he's just willing to alter shape towards the opponent, uh, you know, depending on the opponent, which is great. So we've seen him play a few um, formations in, in pre-season. The 4-2-3-1 up until Barcelona, for me, looks the weakest, which was really worrying because that was, for me, the most sensible Premier League uh, formation for him to start with. Um, but and but what looks the best up until Barcelona was the diamond midfield because it can accommodate so many of our excellent midfielders. And if you can win a game in midfield, you can win a game. Um, but I wasn't too sure how the two strikers was going to work. And obviously the wingers suffer because you don't play wingers. And, you know, what happens to... Don't worry too much about Willian and Pedro, but Pulisic and hudson Adoy, do they suffer or do they play as a supporting striker? So even though the midfield diamond looked excellent with Barkley at the tip, he's been excellent, Mount on the right. You know, you could have Ruben Loftus-Cheek on the left or Jorginho and Kante. So the diamond looked really good, but I was worried about 4-2-3-1, but it looked excellent in against Barcelona for the majority of the parts of that game so would you agree with that how do you feel about the formations and stuff like that to be honest I I can I can see where you're coming from where you said until the Barcelona game you weren't fully convinced by the 4-2-3-1 mm. I think obviously watching the games in pre-season there were for example the first half where we played two up top with Tammy and Michy mm. that looked promising but yeah, I, that's I, the I, diamond, yeah considering we've only got three strikers I don't think it's going to be a good option considering Olivier Giroud has never been even known to play 90 minutes of football week in week out twice mm. a week sometimes mm. so the 4-2-3-1 for me and again last season I was I was a Jorginho critic mm. I'm not going to say I was a I was in the Jorginho love camp or the hate camp it was I was I was critical of him mm. because I knew what he could do but I didn't think he was doing it enough particularly with his yeah, his favourite manager mm. in charge. But what we saw against Barcelona from Jorginho was something that was completely missing last season. And I think it's something that Frank has obviously gone in and said to him that he needs to press further up the field. Mm. Or giving him well, licence to, I think, more. Yeah, 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 I think so. And mm. I mean, obviously, everything will be dependent on when N'Golo Kante comes back from injury. Mm. I've, I've seen some people suggesting maybe that Kante's place in the Chelsea team is questionable now, nah. uh, which I think is complete, completely ludicrous. Yeah. Like, there's, there's no, no doubts in my mind that whatever formation we play mm. under Frank Lampard will 110% accommodate N'Golo Kante first mm. at all costs. Yeah, that's interesting because I mean I, I I reacted immediately when you said that because Frank I, I've seen him as a pundit, as Derby manager make comments at one point and obviously as Chelsea manager he's just always reiterating how he thinks N'Golo Kante is amazing so I think he's buzzing that I think he's buzzing so much that he gets to coach this midfielder I know he it's almost the opposite of the mold of Frank as a midfielder but he's so excited to be coaching Kante probably almost equally as he would have been had Hazard stayed at the club. So, you know, Kante's going to be starting. But I tell you what, uh, George, that that Barca game, the double pivot of 
Jorginho and Kovacic look rather tasty. Um, one thing I think Chelsea have got to be incredibly thankful for for Maurizio Sarri is uh, high press at times. We're good at, I mean, that's translated well to Frank. But Chelsea, this Chelsea team are now inherently, inherently, but they've developed such a good confidence in passing out from the back. That yeah. uh, and that's come from you know sorry ball and third commas. So with the, the, Fr- Frank's been very lucky to just pick that. Up. Oh, very confident, lovely. Now we can just play my football moving forwards. So that's in the, the you know the, the defenders that seems to be sort of um, present there. But the double pivot against Barcelona when I know they were knackered and they weren't fit, but when they were pressing like Barcelona to try and get the ball back. Um, Jorginho and Kovacic they were so comfortable just playing out of tight spaces together. And that, for me, they're they're very different in the sense of I really rate Jorginho. I, I was I liked him at Napoli. I think I've always seen his positives. Um, but with Kovacic, I again I was always been a, a big fan. You know, neither of them were big offensive players, but Kovacic, the way he picks up the ball and travels with it, it's literally like Eden Hazard. Now I've I've, I've always said, look, <laughs> I'm not saying he's Eden Hazard. He doesn't have the one twos. He can't dribble past people like Hazard. He can't finish like Hazard. But because he's built, if you look at the shape of their bodies, they're like exactly the same. Um, he can like carry the ball the same and he's incredibly press resistant. So therefore, he's really confident with ball progression. So that was a really tasty looking um, uh, deep double pivot. You know, how how do you feel? Uh, just while we're sort of on this, how do you feel about Kovacic? Do you feel like he has he comes out of the team when, you know, Ruben comes back and Kante comes back? Or what, do you well, see him being a rotational player? First of all, I think he's not doing himself any injustice right now to get a guaranteed start in place at yeah. the start of the season. I think he's been great. I think, uh, obviously, we saw the first thing that we could really talk about was the assist for Mason Mount, getting yeah. further forward again, making yeah. those incisive passes behind the defensive line, mm. which is something that we didn't see from him last season either. So I think whatever Frank is doing with those, I, I'd like to say, more defensively-minded midfield players, not necessarily the players that you would see in a... Frank Lampard-esque position scoring goals from outside the box. Yeah, yeah. I feel as though both of those two going forward, if they can carry on showing what they're showing now in terms of, like you say, the ball retention, Mm. moving the ball in a forward direction as opposed to side to side. Mm. And like you say, Kovacic, when he is travelling with the ball, Mm. I haven't actually ever made the the Hazard comparison myself, but now you mention it and Mm. I picture it in my mind looking back to that game, particularly against Barcelona, mm. the way he did hold the ball and get out of those tight spaces Very was absolutely yeah. brilliant. And yeah. when we're looking at the transfer market, what you get for forty million, mm. like people are questioning it at first. I was questioning it at first. Mm. I was like, oh, really? Did he do enough last season? Mm. Then it kind of uh, all the arguments came up. It's like, well, yeah, we can't buy anybody else, and we need the numbers. So mm. now we're in a position where we've got multiple midfielders that are doing very good things in preseason. Yeah. And what do we go for? But I think Kovacic is definitely up there he's, with the starting eleven. He's silky man. He's, he's he is for what he does. He's Galactico quality in terms of ball progression, press resistant. Uh, you know, if, he, if you don't, if you're not going to rely on him to score goals, he's such a, an elite level player that doesn't get phased by a position. He does what Hazard does when he's in possession. He sees the opponent coming in and he just turns his back on them. He knows exactly when to move his body to protect the ball as like a sort of he's got that little goblin Hazard body. <laughs> so <laughs> the goblin. So I really rate it, man. So let's talk about some other midfielders, George, while we're on it. Um, oh man, so we're, 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 we're flush now. So basically, I Ruben Loftus-Cheek's my boy. I think he's superb. He's a bit like a new age Rude Huller. He's strong. He's technical. He can dribble with both feet. He can cut, you know, he can curl one in the top corner. There was that great game in the Europa League where <clears throat> him, excuse me, him and Hazard scored the identical goal, but Ruben's was a little bit better, which is, which is quite <laughs> fans. So he's, for me, he's, you know, he's poster boy for the, Academy and club, absolutely love Ruben. But and I was a, I was of the inclination of yeah, sent Mount on loan, maybe a Premier League loan, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know see how he gets on. But then Ruben got injured. Frank came and Mount's his boy, and I've seen a bit more of Mount now. He looks so so good. And then you know I I did rate him in the past, but I thought he might not make it at Chelsea. Ross fucking Barkley, mate. He's, he's had the absolute blinding preseason <laughs> and playing at the tip of that diamond. Like, Ruben or Mount don't have to play in the number 10. 
I mean, neither is Ross, really, but I tell you what, in a number 10 behind two strikers or, like, at the tip of a diamond or something, Ross Barkley is looking absolutely excellent. Um, how, how do you feel about those other midfielders, and do you agree with me with, um, with Ross Barkley in that one? I completely agree with you. I think there were so many elements of the game, uh, the previous match before Barcelona, where I think, you know what, Ross deserves to be starting the match. Mm. And when he wasn't starting the match, I was kind of disappointed because I did feel as though Frank was going to go into the game against Barcelona playing what he would consider to be his best 11 available to him at this point. Mm. So when I didn't see Ross Barkley in the team, Mm. obviously it's very difficult to get frustrated because you've got Mason Mount in the team. And this goes back to the whole positivity around Chelsea right now. Mm. It is that we are blessed with so many good options. But when I look back at Ross Barkley's time at Everton, there were so many moments where he was a match winner. He was a game changer for a team that needs somebody to be able to do that because they're not competing right at the top. They needed somebody to turn up and score goals and win them games. And Mm. Ross Barkley was that. And when we signed him for what was a bargain price, I can't remember the exact figure. 15 million. Yeah, that's Mm. that's an absolute bargain for an English player who does have the potential. And I think there is an age where you have to stop talking about potential with a footballer Mm. because, you know, we have to kind of forget the past and we have to forget what he did when he was 20 or 21 years old. But what we're seeing from him now, like you're saying, playing in that number 10 kind of role, supporting the striker, it's like, it's kind of just written in the stars, isn't it, really? Mm. Like, you've got Frank Lampard posing for a picture, squad photo, when everyone gets back from Japan, he's leaning on Ross Barkley's shoulder. Yeah. It's like, he could do that role. He could do the Frank Lampard role. Yeah, he could do. Like, from a bit of, but when the first thing, when I remember the, vid, the Chelsea media video when Barkley signed, he the first thing he referenced was like, you know, who's your favourite footballers growing up and he's like oh because I play midfield I'm a number 8 I like to um, obviously Big Frank and he just t- t- talked about how he loved Frank Lampard um, oh, yeah, obviously, I know he's a, he's a scouser but he's Evertonian so he's not going to say Steven Gerrard is he <laughs> but um, he uh, yeah so he's like Big Frank and you know ob- and he had such a good application Barkley like when he knew Saru was going to be the coach he immediately studied Napoli arrived early for as soon as well when Saru eventually arrived and he chose Barkley early because he's like oh he's he was in the best physical condition he'd ever been in his career, Barkley. He'd studied Napoli for Sari. So Sari was like, great application, great, great work ethic. You're in, and he was generally quite good on the Sari. But now, he gets to play under this guy who was like, you know, gushing over. He's like, Frank Lampard's your coach now, mate. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, step uh, up. Yes, yeah, so, you know, he's probably buzzing, right? So... I don't know, man. I think, like you say, abs- in hindsight, 15 million. I know he was running his contract right down or whatever, but 15 million for what is a full England international. You know, Southgate will have no reservations calling him up every single time. You're Ross Barkley, you know. Um, we'll see, we'll see what. Did he won the FA Cup and Europa Cup for Chelsea now? So he's looking like a, like a tidy little player. You know, Barkley could be excellent top tier for like another six years or something. So... Very, very good. Watch this space. Um, so let's talk about the Barcelona game a bit more pre-season. I want to get your thoughts, mate, on all three strikers. So I'm not going to provoke your condition, you, of any of my <laughs> opinions first. But l- let me hear what you think about all three that we've got on, on the books at the club at the moment. All right, let's start with Olivier Giroud. Let's talk about the Europa League final goal scorer against his former club. Oh, and, and, top, and top scorer as well in the, in the competition. Exactly, goals, yeah. exactly. Underrated. I think Olivier Giroud, not only does he have the most acute world-class heel in world football. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. Just as a side little caveat. Mm. I feel as though for what he does, when he when he holds up the ball, when he's in the air, to score goals, the, the majority of strikers, what I've seen, they, they just try and get it straight away as hard as they can and hit the ball into the back of the net or at least try and just shoot. Mm. Olivier Olivier Giroud doesn't just shoot he waits and he Mm. waits and he waits until the perfect opportunity with the perfect angle arises Mm. and for me in terms of what a striker needs to do yes he doesn't score enough goals but I think when you look at his his goals to minutes ratio I don't know the exact statistic but it's pretty good it's not that bad yeah and also just while we're on Giroud before I get your thoughts on others he um obviously he's one of those players that make the team better like you know people take the piss out of him for not scoring a goal in the world cup but uh Deschamps took Giroud out of the team for one game France were awful he brought him back in France were excellent he literally was like the catalyst of making the young inside forwards really good you know when he played 
Dembele, Griezmann, and Mbappe together. They couldn't do anything. But as soon as he lumps Giroud back in there, the two uh, in you know inside forwards or wingers that they were excellent. So, and, and uh, you know, and he scores absolute world. If you look at Giroud's show reel, he's either scoring like a bicycle <laughs> kick, a bullet header, a scorpion kick, or he's doing, well, you know, he he scored what was an amazing free kick in the in Europe last season, and also he. Do you remember that goal against Southampton where he just dribbled past three or four players and then toe pokes in? That, that was like a saving Private Ryan slow motion thing where there's just bodies falling all around him, you know. That was almost like a Lionel Messi impression, so he... Very scored. good. So, so, yeah, so... So, yeah, I'll, I'll let you keep going. Let me, yeah, your thoughts on all the other two strikers and then how you see them featuring, maybe. And we'll get into it a bit more in the second half, but for the moment, how, how you think they're performing. Yeah, so I think obviously Giroud's got the two goals in preseason as well, which is exciting for him. Yeah. I do feel as though he's never really been a 90 minutes twice a week striker. So yeah. in terms of leading that on, mm. Tammy Abraham's obviously been playing in a very competitive league, a very strong league. I don't think there's a question as to whether or not the physicality of the Premier League is going to be too much for Tammy. No, yeah, I think. He's got confidence. He's got bucket tons of confidence, which is exactly what you need from a striker, particularly from a Chelsea striker. I think we've been blessed over the years with, you know, two of the best examples in world football of a striker that really knows how to hold himself, who has that confidence in Didier Drogba and Diego Costa. Mm. Um, Obviously, we're talking not just about any old Premier League team. We're talking about Chelsea, who are used to winning the trophy, competing in the Champions League, wanting to win FA Cups every season, Carabao Cups as well. Is Tammy Abraham going to be the man to play twice a week in competitions of that caliber mm. up against the opposition that he's going to be playing against, considering we've only got teams like Barnsley and Rotherham to compare it against? Mm. That yeah. is a question I don't know the answer to, and I don't think anybody does. Mm. But, but, but Yeah, go on, mate, go on. No, go on, you go. You I was go. just going to say on Tammy, the, the one good thing that we'll probably maybe talk about in the next half as well, with like Chelsea youngsters and stuff, is that they did win coming through the academy. They're used to winning. So if they can translate that winning mentality with just youthful fearlessness to the top tier, um, it could work, you know, it could work. And, and with, um, you're right, the physicality, is, for me, for my money, is no different in the Premier League than it is down in that slog of the championship. It just might be a little bit quicker up in the Premier League. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I'll, I agree with you. I think in the second half we'll probably talk about how we'll see, you know, the first team looking like so we can expand on that. But how, how about in pre-season and generally your thoughts on Batshuayi, mate? Do you know what? I've, I've always had a soft spot for Mishy. I say yeah. it pretty much in every video because people like to think that... I, some people think that I think Mishy is like this world-class 40-goal-a-season striker. Yeah. It's, it's just because I have a tattoo of him on my wrist. It's <laughs> like I, I have an affinity that most people don't have with yeah. Mishy Batshuayi. Yeah. But from what I've seen of him, again, he looks really good. You know, like mm. People question his first touch and... From what I've seen in pre-season, he's actually got a pretty good first touch for a striker. He holds up the ball. Mm. He sticks his back into two defenders at once, which draws more players out of the game. He offers the pass. And I think, again, it's a confidence thing with Mishy. I think he needs to be scoring goals consistently. Mm. And how do you do that as a striker? You need to get minutes. True. So I think for him, he's on his last chance saloon at Chelsea. I think if this season doesn't work out for him, Mm. I think we've probably for for his benefit and for Chelsea we need to get rid of him yeah um it's it's interesting with Michy right because um well he played in a two for Marseille so you know if we do play two striker system it could work but you know what on a bit of a tangent with Michy like Chelsea have always been they've always profited off being a bit of a bastard team you know have titan characters and get stuck in you know us versus them mentality it's always worked incredibly well certainly since jose came in um but it doesn't help i mean it doesn't hurt rather having really likable characters in your team for example ngolo kante the sweetest man in football like, no one dislikes him right everyone loves him and it's nice to have that little <clears throat> edge in your team the thing is michi batshuayi is an absolute even though he looks quite strong and beastly as a striker in pre-season that's impressed me he is that happy-go-lucky absolute sort of silly goofball kind of guy now this might (laughs) sound really trivial to you but do you think like do you think that's the kind of character you want playing center forward like at least you know tammy's fun but tammy can go killer mode do you know what i mean and like there's that uh what was it when they there's like there's been 
games or like on the youth level when they played a cup and someone's tackled his teammate he's straight in their face you know Tammy will get up in your grill and like fight for his teammates and stuff like that Michy just seems so silly Spongebob like kicks the ball in his face at the World Cup his own face celebrating you know what I mean when he, when he kicked the ball at the crossbar and it just like smacked him in the face yeah it's that kind of silly goofball like thing that I just wonder so a club like Chelsea do we need someone a bit more mean up front or is that just too trivial do you think I'm just being silly I mean, I think it would be nice if we had someone mean up front. Mm. And I think if you, like you mentioned, when he played at the two, with the two up top for Marseille, yeah. it it would be nice to have, in a hypothetical world where we could sign whoever we wanted to, yeah. it would be nice to have somebody to nurture Mishy into a, into a side like that who is a bit meaner, who he can mm. look at and be like, ah, well, actually... I could do that as well because I'm probably just as strong as you, but I just don't carry myself the same way. Mm. I think Mishy is a is a player, is a footballer, particularly in a social media age, where he needs role models around him. I feel to to make him the striker that he could be. Mm. Because he's big and strong, isn't he? It's not like I'm I'm, I'm talking about him like some like little weedy nerd, he like SpongeBob, but he's he's a big boy. Like he's he can handle himself. It's just yeah, um, no, he's got the size, he's got the strength. There's no doubt about that for me. But I completely agree with what you say. We we want a striker who's got a killer instinct. Yeah, like he doesn't strike fit when you see him on social media. Like it doesn't. I know this sounds trivial. Even like someone like Anton Griezmann is a bit silly sometimes. You know, like Hazard's chill. Hazard is happy go lucky, but he's chill and he's like football oozes through him and that's he's like an art form on the pitch and that works but when someone's a bit too like silly you just think oh they don't take him seriously like the night before right if you're an opposition defender and the night before you're like oh bloody hell i'm playing against diego costa tomorrow you probably like you know stare at the ceiling for a couple of hours and it's running through your head but if you're like oh i'm playing against michi batshuayi tomorrow you might just go straight to sleep do you know what i mean yeah <laughs> it's that kind of like extra mental edge i guess but um no, I don't know. Maybe, I'm, you know, we'll have to see. We've got a choice of three. Um, I want to wrap up the first half, George. So, generally, any final thoughts on pre-season so far? I mean, the camp seems to be super happy, and that's probably the most important thing for me. But is there anything else you'd like to pick up on on, on pre-season thus far? Do you know what? I think the only other thing is that, as Chelsea fans, I think it's very important for all of us to not get too carried away about all of the youngsters we've seen. Yes. I feel as though, for example, we've seen Ethan Ampadu go out on loan. Great loan. A lot of people have been... Yeah, it's a Mm. great loan. It's Mm. probably the best loan move he could have got. Mm. But I've seen a few people getting a bit outraged at the fact that we've loaned out Ampadu, yet we've we've kept Tamori, we've kept Bakayoko, we've kept kept Danny Drinkwater. Mm. I think, obviously, there's still three games to go in pre-season. There's still a couple more weeks left of the mm. transfer window, yeah. particularly in the Premier League, but also in European leagues that can continue to make signings, I believe. Mm. I think that we're going to see a lot more players leave, mm. and I think it would be a good thing for that to happen. I think, yes, Fakir Tomori has looked very good in pre-season, but is he going to get anywhere close to the likes of Zuma, Louise, Christensen and uh, what's his face, Rudiger, Rudiger this season? Yeah. Probably not. And if a player is that good, we've got to be able to let him go for the right reasons as opposed mm. to just like getting too carried away with all of this youth, 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 youth. Yeah. yeah. We can't give everybody minutes. Well, that's a poignant point and it gives us a good uh, opportunity to pick up on part two looking forward uh, at the squad, at players and who we can expect to be playing and what how we think the season will go. So um, we'll uh, we'll be back in part two. Welcome back to part two of the Yannick on Chelsea podcast. I'm delighted to say I'm still here, joined by George Benson. We've been talking Chelsea, and um, yeah, we're gonna look forward. We've been we've been talking about players, and I wanted to pick up on that. So, if I may, George, um, how about I throw some players at you, and you tell yeah. me uh, if you see like what if you think they could feature, maybe you know, uh, or what you think about them because. I've got an interesting one that a lot of people were really excited about um, over preseason. Billy Gilmore, right? So he played in number ten. Mm-hmm. He played in like an eight or a six, um, and he looked incredibly good. He looked—he's a quite a petite dude, but he looked very, very good. Do you see any way he could feature, or would you just would you like loan him to the championship? I think he's fresh out of the academy, so I think maybe. Uh, involving him in the squad's ambitious and maybe even a Premier League loan's ambitious. What do you think about him? Do you know what? I 
I want to say yes, I see him playing minutes, but realistically, no. Mm. I don't. I think there are so many midfielders that we have mm. at the club who, yeah. whether whether or not you know Billy Gilmore could become one of the best midfielders in the world, we don't yeah. know that yet. It's yeah. still too early to say. And the early signs are that he's already playing at a level way above his age and current experience. Mm. But he's in a Chelsea team now where there's not only experienced midfielders that are ahead of him, but there's also younger players who are a little bit older, Mm. who have got that little bit more physicality, who are still further in their development than Billy Gilmore. Mm. Um, And like you said about the loans, I think if we could somehow get him into like a newly promoted Premier League club... JT's Villa... I mean that's the perfect one, right? Mm. But I don't. Again, even there, they've made a lot. They spent a lot of money. They made a lot of signings. I don't even think he'd get into their team, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I think for someone like Billy, if you look at the size of him, he kind of looks a bit like Messi in terms of the way he's built. Mm. And I think that the championship would be a harsh lesson for him. Mm. Obviously, he came away from home in Scotland, came down to Chelsea at a very young age. So he's obviously toughened up a lot mentally. Mm. And I think throwing a player like Billy Gilmore into the championship for a club that are looking to compete, to get near the playoffs, potentially looking for promotion, Mm. if he can get a guarantee of minutes there, I think it would be the best thing possible for him. We saw it with Tammy Abraham. He's gone to Villa Mm. and... And Bristol as well. Yeah, and Bristol Bristol City and just bag goals after goal after goal. So... Obviously, different positions, but mm. I don't see Billy getting many, if any, minutes this season at Chelsea. Mm. Um, and that isn't because I don't rate him. I no. just think, realistically, it's not going to happen. So, yeah. send him out on loan. Yeah, I agree. Um, probably the championship would be good. He's so young still. Championship, maybe lower prem. Two two loans, one loan at one place, one loan at another. Then, you know, welcome to the squad kind of thing. Um yeah, I want to get through a bunch of players. Uh, let's. I want to talk to you about Zuma. I want to talk to you about Kennedy. Uh, Hudson Adore, obviously, his new contract. We'll probably both just agree on those factors. But, <laughs> but um, let's talk about. Let's talk. You know what? Let's talk about Kennedy because a few years ago, I thought he was like, really exciting and you know, like loads of potential there. And then like watched him go off the boil a little bit and had a couple of good months at Newcastle and then not that great. But I tell you what. And again, underwhelming as a left back uh, in preseason. Uh, when he's played on the wing a couple of times, it's taken him a while to get into the game. But he's made me think. Oh, you know, while like Hudson Odoi is still injured, he's making me think. Oh, maybe as a utility player as well, both sides can fill in at fullback. Um, you know, is there a slot for him in this in this squad? Because he has done some bits like really high work rate. Um, obviously. Brazilian techers maybe needs to work on some stuff and still quite young so has he like for me I'm I just don't know where to place Kennedy at the moment how, how do you feel about it yeah you you hit the nail on the head there I was gonna say it's kind of like he's having a midlife crisis at whatever age he is right now because yeah, yeah. he doesn't really know where he stands as a footballer not only which loan move he's gonna take from Chelsea but like mm. in terms of where his best position is Mm. He's a left footer, but he likes to cut in from the right. Mm. And again, I agree with you. At left back, it's very underwhelming. I Mm. don't think he's good enough defensively. I think that his finishing isn't good enough. I don't think his awareness in the forward areas is up to the standard that Chelsea would need and expect. Mm. But again, you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said he is that Brazilian kind of player. There's often a lot of issues with young Brazilian players who move away from home where it takes them a while to kind of get a feel for who they are as people, who they are as footballers, mm. how they fit into a system, how they fit into a team. A culture and I think, as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's a mm. huge difference. Like, mm. I, I don't know if you've been to Brazil, but you can, no, no, no. you can feel when you're there that every single young lad, uh, and even women as well now, it's like football is just drilled into them. It's all they know. Mm. But you can translate that to a completely different culture in a completely different country, and you're kind of cold feet. That's exactly what it is. And mm. I think with Kennedy... He just so sometimes he just looks like he's about to do something amazing, and then it's as if the world just goes dark in front of his eyes, and he mm. he doesn't do it. Mm. But you can see, and I mean, even in the compilation videos that Chelsea post, or like, oh, look at this little highlight from when Kennedy did this against mm. Norwich. It's like he's got it. Like yeah, you've yeah. got it. Yeah. When are you going to show it? Are you going to show it at Chelsea? Mm. And again, I think he's kind of on that last chance saloon now, where if he does go out on loan this season just sell him Mm. because 
if he's going to go out on loan and not play any minutes for Chelsea this year, when we can't sign anybody, when he's been on the fringes and is he going to go out on loan, is he not? He keeps leaving. If he does go now, just just sell him. Just, mm. just get it over and done with. Mm. And as for where I stand with it, I would give him a chance. Yeah. I think he could be a good utility player. Mm. I think if we do get more injuries, God forbid, I hope we don't, mm. he could fill in in numerous positions if yeah. we really need him to. Mm. And he's dynamic and quick. Uh, yeah. And he looks like he was, you know, try, trying very hard. Now he's, he's definitely putting a shift in, you know, he's pressing and he ran up and down that right flank when he played right wing. Uh, and that's what made me think, fuck, maybe. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so, that's um, what we want to see, you know. I think there's there's other players that I won't name because I get I get told off for talking too much trash about him. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm just going to say it. Bakayoko. Yeah. Like, I, I, again, I don't want him to fail. I want him to succeed. Mm. I want him to be as good as he was at Monaco. Mm. But he, even this preseason... He like, looks lumpy, doesn't he? Him, he does. Like He looks mm. big. He looks like he's been to the gym. He's, spent, he's been lifting some weights or whatever. But mm. like, I want to see you trying and making the proper yeah. effort. He looks Kenneth lost. Does that. Yeah. But yeah. Yes, I totally agree. I tell you what, I tell you what, that that there's a bunch of players I want us to discuss. So let's move on to Bakayoko and Drinkwater. Let's the the underwhelming double pivot that we saw the other day. Um, I feel a little bit bad for Drinkwater because, well, not really because he's a Premier League winner and he's taking an awesome wage and just chilling out in London every day and you know his his his, uh, his life's fine. But um, Frank quite rightly said he wants to give everyone a look in. Drinkwater has won the Premier League. Bakayoko was an incredibly highly rated player in France uh, at, at one point. Um, for me, considering our discussions that we've had uh, in the pod previously about midfielders and youngsters coming through and this, that and the other, and top tier midfielders like Kovacic, Kante, Jorginho, as well as the young English lads like you know Barkley, Loftus-Cheek and Mount, I feel like we could both we could quite cu- quite comfortably is what I'm trying to say get rid of both of them um you know I, 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 do, do drink water everyone laughs at him but you know I feel kind of a little bit bad for him but I won't cry for Bakayoko purely because it just never really had any form of affiliation with the fans not that m- many players do these days but he just he never he he performed well against Spurs a couple of games and maybe a Atletico Madrid in his first year but he just doesn't He's not a clutch player. I know that he's difficult in that position, but I just feel like we could quite happily axe both of them. Do, do you feel the same? I do, and I think we will. If I'm honest, I think that I think I saw something today where they said that Frank wants to maybe get rid of up to eight players, mm. and if at least one of those eight isn't either Bakayoko or Drinkwater, then I am <laughs> I'm going to start questioning Frank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because like, surely. Surely, like for me, it's an absolute no-brainer that they are seventh and eighth, respectively, in mm. the pecking order. Yeah, it's just the only thing is, it's between them, and they cost seventy-five million, and then obviously all the rest are like freebie kids from the academy. So the clubs are going to look at them as assets and think, "Oh, I'll play them a bit and try and sell them or something." But you know, if the, if the clubs got Morata money, the club has got Hazard money, they should just basically flog them for whatever they can get for them, in my opinion. I agree, and I yeah. think it's only, it's only a matter of time before these players start to lose the value that Chelsea are so good at getting out of other clubs. Mm. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, Grenner Sky will probably still get a good few quid for them. I was so. going to say we might even match manage to get a hundred mil off Man United for Bakayoko. Imagine. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Actually, that's but that's the interesting thing though. Bakayoko, I mean, he could go to a team like Man United, but you know, you could see him maybe going to a PSG, like PSG paying like. 32 million or something for him and him going there and having a good time in league and again but you could see drink water as an english guy um with his with english premier league experience you, i could see him going to and being a constant regular in like a lower half premier league table quite a uh, uh, club you know quite comfortably like say i don't know Maybe not necessarily like a Bournemouth because of the way they play, but something of like around that part of the table. I, I could see him going there and just playing week in, week out. You know what I mean? Do you reckon? He could play 38 games a season for Newcastle, happily. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, although and Newcastle will probably get relegated. That's, that's true. But then I, I think at the way it's been going, I think Danny Drinkwater, he, like you say, he's been making a great living in London mm. for Chelsea. And he's, he's not even playing for Chelsea, like. I think mm. I made this point in my video where I, I, on my channel where I said I think he should leave and I think he should go. At what point as a professional footballer do you look at what you've done in your career? Do you look at what you could still do in your career? What are you doing now? Mm. Like, 
he surely doesn't see a future for him at Chelsea. Like, as as a, as a man himself, like he must look at it and think, "Am I going to play here? No. Yeah. Am I happy to just sit on the bench or not even on the bench? Sometimes, like, yeah. I can do it." Do you know what made me laugh, George? Because like, as you were saying that, I was like, I laughed at myself thinking of the parallels between Danny Drinkwater and Gareth Bale. Because <laughs> of his like, situation at Real Madrid. <laughs> like the things I've done in my career, the titles I've won, and you know, the wage I'm earning now and not playing. But um, yeah, they're, they're sort of um, very different players, let's say. I'm oh, sure right. if you said to me if I had a 600k like just being plugged into my account every week, my answer may be slightly different. But mm. as of right now, I'm not making 600k a week. So. Yeah, well, exactly. Perspective. Okay, so well, that's that. Those midfielders done. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's talk about Kurt Zuma. For my money, uh, an excellent, a, a really good centre back that can get better. Premier League experience starts for France now. Apparently, the world champions. Did for, had a very good season for Everton, and if Harry Maguire is going for eighty million pounds, I think Zuma should be like a sixty million pound plus centre back. <laughs> you know, so we taking getting him back is huge, really. Um, <clears throat> you can understand why he might want to go to Everton if he's looking at. Christensen, Louise, and Rudiger, who have all been the free and basic starting centre backs for Chelsea over the last couple of years, and they have all been sort of starters in and out. He might feel like, you know, and even Tamori, you might look at Tamori and be like, "Well, this is Lampard's boy." Just say in his perspective, not knowing Tamori might go on loan or whatever. He might think that there's four centre backs there that Frank might have the inclination to play over me. So I've been starting week in week out at Everton. I've been one of their best players. They really appreciate me. Everton have got a great coach, Marco Silva. They're going places, a good side. I could be a starter for them and really appreciated. Or I could really struggle at trying to be a starter for Chelsea, who aren't like, you know, champions of England at the moment. So obviously, he played the day when SP came off, he gave him the captain's armband. Frank's been waxing lyrical about him in the press conferences. Like, I want him. He's Chelsea player. I want him. I like him. I rate him. What do you think about Zuma? What do you think is going to happen in terms of him staying or going? And if he does stay, do you see him becoming a starter or at least a regular? I definitely see him becoming a regular. I'm not sure about a starter. I think if we break down those those defensive centre-backs that we have, I think our strongest and best defender in that position is Rudiger. Mm. I think when he's fully fit, I think he's brilliant. I think he's one of the first names on the team sheet for me. Mm. And then obviously David Luiz, he's got the experience. He's a proper Chelsea player. Mm. Obviously Frank really likes him. He's a good player to have in the dressing room. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So Mm. I think he is obviously, for for me, going to be the first starting two. Mm. But as we've always seen with David Luiz, sometimes he's he's as bad as he is great. Mm. And Kurt Zuma has been a consistent performer, whether that was for us when he was playing for us. Or, like we saw at Everton last season, he was one of their best players. There's a reason why Everton are looking at maybe 50, 60 million, putting in a bid to try and secure his services full time. Mm. So I think for Chelsea as a club, you've got to look at that and think, OK, well, you know, he's been on our books for a while. Has he been given as good of an opportunity as he could have? Mm. Probably not. Is he ready now? Yes, he is. Mm. And I think if we look at David Luiz's age, for me, Kurt Zuma is ahead of Christensen in the pecking order because for me I've not been fully convinced by Andreas Christensen I think those two are in the same bracket Zuma and Christensen potential to be top class borderline world class centre backs Mm. maybe I think that Christensen's kind of slowed down in a way Mm. I I read a few places last season that he he suffers from like pre-match sickness or something yeah apparently apparently he shits himself (laughs) Wow. Came. Like he needs to, he needs to take a dump. Yeah, <laughs> That's when Sari mean, like, was talking about in the press conference. I saw her, he laughed and got a bit embarrassed. Like, I don't know what to say. Anyway, yeah, like, go on. It's like you don't want to take the piss out of the kid because, you know, like this happens to a lot of yeah, people yeah, in a lot of definitely. professions. But yeah. we're talking about a business that is measured upon results. Of course, yeah. And I think for me, if I was being confident as to say who are my top Go to centre backs next season for Chelsea. Mm. It would be Rudiger, Louise, Zuma, Christensen, and I would be very happy to interchange Zuma and Louise on a frequent basis. So mm. it's well, no brainer in my eyes. We've got to keep him. Yeah, I agree. And let's, I think we're both going off the premise here that tomorrow he say he gets a maybe a Premier League loan or something like that. Hopefully, or maybe Ger- Germany again. But it's it's horses for courses, really. Like obviously, Christensen played in midfield for Gladbach. He's good ball player so you've got your ball playing centre backs in Christensen and Louise they both started I think against 
Barcelona, and they were very good in the ball. So you've got if you want to if you want to do that, but if you're going to play against a team that you think is going to be in your final third the whole time, maybe you go for a, a partnership of Zuma and Rudiger, strong in the air, two sort of like warriors that are really good at sort of sitting in. But if you're like, right, or if you mix up, oh, we want a ball player, just someone to step in midfield, and we want that, you pick him and him. So it's good to have two and two in that sort of mould. Um, interestingly, both Zuma and Rudiger, more so Zuma can like morale into midfield as well. So I feel like there's enough of a difference between all four to make different partnerships. And if we know anything about Frank so far, that he's very pragmatic in his approach to the opposition... So he'd probably fancy having this like different selection of combinations that, you know, aren't too samey. So I agree with you. I reckon those four on the on in the squad would probably be perfect. Um, so let's stay in the back line. Fullbacks, I think we'll probably we'll probably agree. I mean, I don't know if you're on the Reese James hype train, but I'm bloody driving the train at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he's got everything I did a YouTube video on him about how I think he's excellent obviously he's injured Aspie's very good at one on one defending and he's looking a little bit better in terms of dynamic right back play but in terms of skill set Reese James should, if he can stay fit could absolutely be a, the starting right back for Chelsea next season in terms of physicality and ability um, so I want to get your thoughts on that and also just to tee you up left back position I was in the camp massively Emerson just because he suits the role better than Alonso in terms of again skill set as a conventional left back as opposed to Marcus Alonso where he flourished as a left wing back but Alonso looks like that maybe maybe and this is only just recent thinking for me that he might actually benefit from the way Frank wants him to play say maybe they compensate somewhere else on the pitch so let me get your thoughts on both fullback positions mate do you know what? I think Reese James is is going to push Aspi to start. Mm. I know it's Wigan, but like he, there's a reason why he was in that Championship Team of the Year last mm. year. He wasn't putting in Championship style performances. He was putting in top Premier League performances. Absolutely. We're talking about a youngster here who has absolutely as big of a chance as Trent Alexander Arnold to make an impact. Mm. At a similar size club, I really believe that. Yeah. So if you're in the driver's seat, I will take a first class row three. Yeah, mate. I think Alex Goldberg might want a first class seat as well. <laughs> mate, he's in front of the train. <laughs> he's I could try trying to get him in for ages, but this is sick. I say he's on the train. Yeah. So I think for me, it's Aspi is he's been an incredible player for Chelsea, mm. one of the bargained Premier League signings mm. of the past Model ten years. Model professional as well. Yeah, model professional, and he's our captain. Mm. So, of course, I think to start the season, at least, Reese James has got an injury, so it's a no-brainer that Aspi is the number one. But I can certainly see Reese James getting some minutes in the Cups to start with and maybe even coming off the bench mm. and starting a couple of Premier League games against opposition that we should be beating. Mm. I know it's, it's it's not really a competition in the Premier League where we can be flexible in that sense, where it's like, oh, we'll give you a run out today, let's see what you can do. It's not really like that. It's yeah. like try and stick with your best 11 but mm. like we say mm -hmm. Frank is, is showing that he's a very pragmatic coach and this is something that we could see as for the left back position moving on quite quickly mm. it's a no brainer for me as well Emerson all day long mm. Marcus Alonso frustrates me mm. I think he's done a good job as a Chelsea player particularly in Conti's first season mm. but again I think the way we're going forward I don't see Alonso's qualities fitting into any system potentially that we're going to see from Frank Lampard moving forward. That's interesting. And the most frustrating thing of Alonso is, like, I, I've, I've sort of echoed this on this podcast, so the, the listener will have to forgive me, but there's one that moment of depiction where Hazard playing on the left with Alonso, trying to combine with him and wanting him in a certain place and he was never there. There was that picture of Alonso's back with the camera and Hazard just shrugging his shoulder going, look at that expression on his face going like, what the hell are you doing? Like, come on, man. And Hazard's like a really like sweet dude, but for him to completely lose it and be frustrated with someone he's supposed to have a partnership with, you know this dude probably hasn't got it. And as soon as that left-hand side consisted of Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Hazard and Emerson... The combinations came and it suddenly looked like, you know, fast, dynamic football. And that's what Frank Lampard will want at Chelsea. He'll want these, you know, young Chelsea players to be able to do these quick touches, combinations, attacking the space, through balls and playing between the lines uh, down the left-hand side. And as, as good as Alonso is at hitting the ball with his left foot, he's 
good at sniffing out poachy goals and he can header and he's a dead ball specialist. For this Chelsea side, I do worry. But I feel like there is a market for Alonso. I think if someone wants an offensive left wing back, um, it would get you a, you know, a hat full of goals for a campaign. He was probably up there on the top of the list, you know. Won a few titles with Chelsea now. So I reckon we could flip him and double our money um, for what we paid for him. So I'm with you on that. Uh, what have we done? We've done the back line. We've talked a lot about the midfield. Let's talk about two wingers before we talk about our expectations for the club moving forward. So before we talk about new Hollywood signing Captain America, um, Callum hudson Adoy hasn't been announced by the club uh, at time of recording, I don't think. But it looks like he's signed a five-year deal. People whinging about 100k, but... I don't really mind that it's that much because I know he's a teenager and hasn't played much, but in two years down the line when he's 20 years old and has played a lot for Chelsea and he's still on only 100k, that will look like, you know, players on 300k might not be doing what he's doing. So how do you feel about him signing a new contract? How do you feel about him coming out from the injury? Do you think he's going to make a full recovery in terms of confidence and playing ability? And just express your thoughts on it, George. I think he's going to make a full recovery. I don't doubt that for a second. I think Ruben could be the one we have to worry about in terms of full recoveries. Right. Um, as for Hudson Odoi staying, there's been a lot of people saying like, oh, if he if he's not ready to sign a contract and he thinks he, he can get a hundred grand a week and he's only X Y Z. I think for me, if you lose Eden Hazard and then you lose your best prospect in a position mm. where you've just lost your best player. It's it's crazy. We, yeah. we we had to do everything we possibly could to get him to sign that new deal. Mm. And now that it's looking like he is, we can stop thinking about, oh, maybe he's going to go to Bayern Munich. Maybe yeah. we're going to be left without a, a player to come in to replace Eden Hazard. Now that he's committed his future to Chelsea, I think there was never a doubt as to whether he wanted to stay or not. I think there was a lot of influences uh, within his own personal camp that yeah. made things quite complicated there. Yeah. But he's a brilliant player. I think that... I can understand the scepticism regarding his age and what he's actually done and what he hasn't done already to justify that. Mm. But we're talking about football in 2019. We're talking about a young English player mm. who everybody is talking about. In English international, by the way, competitive. He's played a competitive England game for Gareth Southgate, remember? So it's no, yeah. he's no, he's, you know, it's no mug, basically. No, and I'm excited for him to come back. I mm. think as soon as he's back, he is straight into the first 11. Yeah. Depending, obviously, on the performances of other wingers that we've got in the team. Let's just let's not forget that. As much as some people may not like them, we do have an abundance of those as well. Yeah, exactly. And Frank, well, he says he wants to um, infiltrate. <laughs> infiltrate is not the word. He wants to implement. <laughs> he wants to infiltrate youth. That sounds dreadful. He wants to <laughs> implement youth into his team. But um, he also respects, you know, he played into his 30s and understands that there's a lot to gain from older players so yeah he won't just you know cast the older lot to the side so it's going to be a meritocracy um just quickly on hudson Adoy, did you see that instagram story that rudiger posted yes <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it listener uh i don't know if we'll still be on his insta but he's, he's he uh, it's from it's probably a picture from someone else it's it's Callum Monson Adoy looking fresh in the club with some girl grinding up on him. It's on Rudiger's story, and he they've got quite a bromance, like a big brother, little brother thing going on. And it's love it, that. yeah, Rudy absolutely lo- laughing his head off at it. Um, all right, so let's move over to big money signing Christian Pulisic, Captain America himself. Uh, when we signed him, loads of people gave Chelsea stick, like oh, you paid X amount for a player who scored only this amount of goals. But I always rated him because I rated him when he was seventeen. And then when we signed him, uh, uh, people joked about um, Sancho taking his place, but the reality is uh, he didn't want to sign a new deal at Dortmund, so there was issues there, he got an injury, so there was loads of variables why he wasn't starting, but when he came back into the team with Sancho, he played very, very well, and arguably he was the more important out of the two at the very end of Dortmund's season, and then he continued that good form into the Gold Cup, where he won Young Player of the Tournament, Uh, and he's played a couple of games for Chelsea and he looked very bright on his first start in my opinion so what do you think about it mate generally do you know what I'm, I'm excited by Pulisic I think as a as Chelsea is a footballing business and footballing entity I think having the best player in the United States during a time where they're going to be hosting a world cup within the next 
like eight years is a mm. massive deal from a business perspective for Chelsea there. I think obviously a lot uh, of behind the scenes conversations would have used that as like a really good selling point as to mm. why they should go and buy him. Yes, I think we can't point, underestimate yeah. that. Yeah. But um, in terms of his qualities, I think that anybody expecting the Eden Hazard fireworks and Pulisic immediately is probably going to be let down. Yeah. But I'm excited for him. I think we saw against Barcelona, he does have some electric pace that he's got in the locker if he needs it. Mm. And uh, I think the, the, the one thing that we need to, to see improve from Pulisic over the next 12 months or two years or so is probably his finishing. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably not been his strong point, even at Dortmund. And I think we saw it against Barcelona. There were times where he did cut in, got into good shooting positions, and mm. there was never be any doubt in my mind if it was Eden Hazard that it's mm. only ending up in the bottom corner or the top corner. There was no question. Yeah. Um, and I think with Pulisic, again, it's a confidence thing in front of goal. And if he can sort that out, then I think we may have found ourselves a bargain. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm with you. And again, like uh, a few other players in the club, he seems to be a really sort of, again, model professional, really just works hard and, you know, great can-do attitude and no ego and stuff. And that's what you want in modern football, especially from a young 20-year-old talent. You want them to be humble. And... Um, Bowl accounts, he's all of that, Christian Pulisic. So yeah, I'm, I, I hopefully like many aren't expecting Hazard style stuff, but I'm expecting um, a young, hardworking kid who's talented, who like you know what he's actually such a fast ball carrier as well. Like he can pick up the ball down lower down the flank, and he will fly with that ball. So that's really good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've kind of covered like the spots, how we feel about players in the team. So to sort of wrap up the pod, we're going to talk about maybe expectations. Now, I was incredibly cautious when I sort of did a league prediction. I said Chelsea, I think Chelsea might finish seventh, but you know, it's no problem as long as Chelsea look like they're getting an identity and moving somewhere. Uh, and you know, the transition then is absolutely fine. But you know what? I'm slipping into the hype train mode and I'm thinking about, well, you know, I haven't signed Bruno Fernandes yet. They'd still, um, you know, I'm not overly convinced by them. Arsenal are generally quite crap. And I put, I saw Leicester do. <laughs> that was so nonchalant of <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, come on. And also, like, um, I think Leicester might do bits, you know. Brendan Rodgers made him look absolutely lethal. They've got such a good squad now. We don't have time to, like, go through their players, but they've got a few take a second to look at Leicester's squad is really really good and I thought you know what maybe they could break into the top six and but you know ever since watching preseason, the, the hype train's going faster and faster and there's that sort of core belief and Frank can inspire the team even if they go for a dip you, you kind of maybe back Frank to get them out of the dip quicker than other coaches so you know I, I'm Thinking, I'm not, you know, thinking more positively. But as I'm the podcast host and not the guest, I don't have to answer any of these difficult questions. I just pose them <laughs> to you, George. So that's all right. How do you feel? What's a realistic finish for Chelsea in the league, in the cups, and in the Champions League? And um, you know, do you think fans will be happy with it? Like, just your sort of prediction of all, just a general rough prediction. So obviously, in football, expectations are the biggest grey area amongst any fan. Like mm. we could sit here and chat to another Chelsea fan tomorrow, and he may be of the the idea that because we've won the Premier League in the last three seasons, if we don't win it again, it's a failure. Yeah. That's someone else's expectation. I can understand that, but for me, I think I kind of break it down into different sections. I think if you're a football club in the Premier League. If you're saying to yourself, right, let's go for top six this season, that's the goal. At mm. what point do you have to say to yourself, OK, well, that might be what we could settle for, but we have to aim for the top four. If, for example, I'll move it away from Chelsea for a second. If we're looking mm. at Leicester and Everton mm. and the, the way they're strengthening their teams, the way they're talking about transfers, who they want to sign and all this stuff they're going to be looking to break into the top six. Mm. Then we look at Arsenal and Man United. They're not strengthening. And at times last season, they were abysmal and they looked like a bottom half Premier League club. Mm. So yeah. when we're looking at Everton and Leicester, maybe for them, it's yeah. realistic to say fifth and sixth. Even but you could Wolves. Also say, yeah. yeah, even Wolves. Even mm. Wolves. I think Europa League might see them struggle a bit yeah, more. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So in terms of the expectations and balancing it off of what I've heard everybody saying like, oh, maybe we can't expect Champions League because we don't have a transfer window and it's it's Frank's first season in the top flight and all this stuff. Mm. I think you have to eliminate that for a second and look at what the difference in a Europa League finish and a Champions League finish is. Mm. And Chelsea, without a shadow of a doubt, mm. 
have to be aiming for the minimum of fourth. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, yes, we can understand it as fans and we could give Frank another year if we finish sixth. I get that. Mm. But in terms of disappointment or elation come May next year, I'll be very happy with Champions League. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I was incredibly cautious with my predictions. But, you know, if it, uh, Spurs have just signed Tangi and Dombele. He's an absolutely excellent player. Fucking Kane scoring from the halfway line. <laughs> I just I feel like Spurs with their yeah. you know with their new stadium. I just feel like they're going to be pick you know Christian Eriksen. Even though he wants to go, I think he's quite happy to stay. They might just be a very difficult prospect. Potch will probably just randomly bring through two youngsters who will just play really well because they come from nowhere. Um, as frustrating as that is, they're quite well run like that's Tottenham. So I feel like they'll still be thereabouts. Um, but fourth would be great. So, just to, to wind up before we do some plugs and stuff, what do you think about the Cups and the Champions League? I'm very much an old school fan in the sense of I want to win every single trophy, whether it's the Carabao Cup mm. or the Premier League. So, mm. I think we have to, considering all of these youngsters and all of the emphasis that Frank's put on it, as us as fans have put on it, I think we have to try and go for the Carabao Cup. Mm. That's the first trophy we can win. We saw it with Mourinho. It was a catalyst for greater success. It yeah. could be the same for Frank. And obviously, football's a little bit different now to when we first got a bit of Russian money. But that's just the way it is. Mm. Um, I want to see an FA Cup run as well. I love the competition. And I think in terms of the Champions League, get out of the group. And it's a Chelsea thing. When we're not expected to win and we're mm. against stronger opposition is when we do our best. So I think get out of the group. And just see where it see goes. See what happens, yeah. And I think, I think for me, a salient point in all of this is, regardless to how Frank might struggle in a league campaign, it looks like he's one to inspire for that one game that suits cup runs really, really well. Now, that was prevalent for me. I mean, did, did you go to the game, the Derby game last season? I didn't go there, no. Okay, so I did. And it was palpable how you could feel like the Lampard presence and how it was important. Obviously... We beat, we knocked him out, but we shouldn't have won that game. He went to Old Trafford, uh, you know, eliminated Manchester United at Old Trafford, and obviously the playoffs. Even though they got to the final and they didn't win, they did. They, you know, they held held a good account of themselves in the final. But that Leeds game, you know, against all odds, that's kind of like cup tournament football. The playoffs, it's the same sort of mould, isn't it? So you can yeah. imagine Frank inspiring for for those games. So I feel like you know we could definitely maybe have a <laughs> an FA Cup or a Carabao Cup. I can see Frank going for that. But um, yeah, so I feel like we've, we've covered a lot, George, today in the podcast. Um, it's been an excellent episode, mate. So before we plug your channel, I'd like to thank you for coming on and joining me and talking. It's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for inviting me. No, it's 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 my pleasure. And uh, hopefully, uh, as the season goes on, I might try and get you back for another episode or two, perhaps. If um, absolutely, if Mr. love to. If Mr. Benson can get down, right? So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this has been George Benson. He is a Chelsea slash football YouTuber. Do you want to plug your YouTube channel, mate, and maybe your social plugs like Twitter and stuff? Oh, this isn't my scene normally, but I will as you've given me the opportunity. Um, so I've got two YouTube channels. One of them is George Benson Travel. The focus of that channel right now is going to be going to matches all over the world. I've got uh, some huge series that I can't talk about where I'm going to literally be traveling constantly for like three years. That's wow. going to be on that channel. He's just talked about it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I have. I have. Yeah. yeah, and it's all football-related stuff, so that's cool. That's awesome. And then I've got the George Benson Football Channel, which is just a little thing I've been working on recently, posting every single day, mm. where I just literally sit in front of the camera and talk, as opposed mm. to it being focused on like travel or cinematics or whatever. So yeah, thank mm. you very much. Well, I'd urge everyone to, to go and check that out, because I'm sure the listener would agree George speaks very well on football, and indeed Chelsea, and you could go and experience more of that on his channel. So yeah, George, thanks again for coming on, mate. You ain't so tough with that bad boy tuck I'ma get it how I'm living, I'ma walk the walk Outline my lines, I rap through thought Body bag the verse, outline the chuck In my life seen trouble, hustle on the double Silence on the trigger like my pick got a muzzle Yo chick like to guzzle, bad boy stay in trouble I only love this paper, sorry I don't I love me baby